Good. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. I remind you to turn your microphones and cameras off. And my name is Ilaria Tassari. I'm co-founder and vice president of European Guanxi. Today, I will moderate the event that will be centered on China's recently approved fourth theme five-year plan. We will better understand, thanks to the presentation of the speaker, uh, today's speaker, why the title of the webinar is Looking at China's Future Through the Lens of the Five-Year Plan, How Ambition Matches Caution. The Five-Year Plan constitutes the pillar of China's economic development and the roadmap to, to understand where China's economy and society are going in the future. The 14th Five-Year Plan announced on the occasion of the National People's Congress during the two sessions has an added um, level of relevance as China prepares for the next phase of its economic development, a phase that will sign the official shift of focus from quantity to quality. The content sets an ambitious yet cautious agenda for China that goes well beyond the economy, speaking to the future of China's society, as well as international relations. During this webinar, we will have a chance to explore this five-year plan in depth and analyze what it means for China and the world's future. It is a pleasure to be here welcoming our speaker, uh, Francesca Giretti. Hello, Francesca. Hi, Ilaria. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, Francesca is finishing a PhD at King's College London where she analyzes Chinese foreign direct investment in the EU. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in Asian languages, markets and culture uh, curriculum China from the University of Bologna, she obtained a master's degree in international relations and diplomacy from the University of Leiden and the Klingendal Institute. She completed an internship at the European Parliament and worked to, for uh, Jakdo Hochschäfer from NATO Secretary General. Francesca is a researcher in Asia Studies at the International Affairs Institute, where uh, she works mainly on projects concerning Chinese foreign policy, Italy-China relations, and Europe-China relations. Before diving into the topic, I remind you uh, to please turn your mics and camera off. Francesca will present the most salient aspects of the topic for around 20, 30 minutes. Then every one of us will have the chance to ask any questions related to the topic for around 30 minutes. In order to ask a question, you can send a private message directly to the account named European Wasi and specify whether you prefer to directly ask the question by turning your mic and camera on or to let the moderator take charge of the question, so me. Uh, Francesca Giretti will then answer to your questions. Stay with us until the end because your thoughts on the topic really matter for us. Indeed, you will see a poll displayed on your screen at the end of the webinar, asking you to select the answers to a few questions. The answers you provide will allow us to get and analyze your opinions for our newsletter. You can find out more on how to actively uh, give your contribution to the newsletter's uh, viewers' perspective by contacting us, uh, in specifically the editorial team via email. This is a great opportunity, of course, for us to know more about your views and to give you a space of dialogue within our network and readers community. Without further ado, I would like to give uh, the floor to Francesca and to, to start this uh, exciting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll share my PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. Um, before we start, thank you again once more to everybody for having me here today. Thank you to all of you for being here today, even though it is a, sa a Saturday afternoon. Um, how do, I don't know how the weather is where you are today in London is relatively nice, so not too bad. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, the five-year plan. I, I, I hear a little bit of echo. Is, is that me? Is there someone having maybe camera uh, the microphone on? Okay, well, I keep going. Just um, yeah. and. Before we start, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I suppose that all of you know what the five-year plan is and 
the sentence in itself kind of already explains what the five-year plan is. Every five years, the um, every five years, China adopts a plan for the development of their economy in the coming five years. And this year, they've adopted the what, the fourteenth five-year plan. Um, before I delve into the details of, you know, some of the aspects that I think are very important within the five-year plan, I just wanted to straightforward, upfront in the beginning, uh, say which are the elements that I think one can grasp regarding where China is directed in the next five years and definitely beyond. Um, the, reasons, the reasons why I thought that this year in particular was a mixture between cautious and ambitious in the mission is because you can see a lot of caution and pragmatism in terms of targets. Usually China is very ambitious also in terms of targets. Um, it sets itself, you know, whether yearly or five yearly targets that are very, um, again, ambitious. While this year you see a lot of caution, mostly directed to his internal public, the idea that you can't really disappoint the Chinese people. Chinese people need to be able to see that their government has been achieving everything that he set himself to achieve. And this is why you see for 2021, for example, um, a very conservative GDP prediction. It is conservative, is 6% growth, which if you look at the global scale, is not that much of a conservative growth. But if you think about how little last year China has grown, um, it is very likely that in 2021, it would grow more than 6%, forecasts say around 8%. Um, and then after 2021, it will settle around 6%. But here is where the interesting part comes to play. Usually you also have a five-year growth target um, and you don't have one this time. And this is because of, of course, as I said, caution, the idea of I can't really set a numerical target if then I don't, I'm not able to achieve it. Um, economy is so unstable at the moment. We don't know when the pandemic is going to end. We don't know what the consequences to the global economy uh, the pandemic will bring. Not as much as not much into um, Chinese internal economy, but you know, of course, China's econ economy is entangled with the rest of the globe's economy. This means if the West, for example, doesn't perform particularly well at the moment, China will see the impact of that low performance. Um, the other reason, however, is what I say in the second point, is the shift from quantity to quality. So the idea that, you know, it's no longer quantitative targets that matter, but it's qualitative targets. It's the idea, what is the content of this development um, rather than how much can we develop? And this is also because they want to try to fight a trend of uh, for example, local government um, cheating in terms of what their growth has been in their communication to the central government and just, you know, agree on a matter of content rather than of uh, quantity. And then cautious again, and we'll get to this more in detail later, is portrayed in the fact that after these massive uh, ambitious announcements of you know green revolution 2060 targets and so on and so forth you don't really say, see a proper path for this green transition um, everyone was expecting this in the five-year plan but we couldn't properly see it um, this doesn't mean that china is not ambitious ambition can be seen in terms of content not just um, in in terms of is sort of renewed uh, will of self-sufficiency, which is not just technological, it's much more general, um, but also the idea that it wants to become at the same time an actor that is much more inward looking in terms of protecting his own interest inside, his own growth inside, his own development, the welfare of his own people and you know the general welfare within China, but also, but also shaping global norms. Um, this is directly um, mentioned within the five-year plan. And of course, as I met, this is just a bit of a provocation for a debate. Is it just global norms or is it an attempt to shape global order, whether one believes or not in global order? Now, moving on to the... Now it's not working. Oh, yeah. Moving on to the uh, content of the five-year plan. Um, the first part is 
Oh no. Okay, the first part is enhanced self-sufficiency in technology. And there is a part one and a part two. The part one is more inward looking. And I think that the best target to describe this is definitely the decision to increase the, G the GDP, uh, the part of GDP dedicated to research and development to more than 7% per year, which in an economy such as that of China is quite a bit of GDP. And of course, then you have this massive list of stuff that I put in the slide, so I don't have to spell it out entirely, but just to make a bit of a sum up, the idea is to target certain sectors of technology, which some, some of which are very well known, like artificial intelligence, quantum technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But others are a bit more um, unknown, and is the idea of you know further developing, for example, the um, the exploration in the deep sea, like what this type of exploration can uh, give us. And at the same time, there's also a, an enhanced effort in creating hubs within uh, the technological hubs within China that could be at a certain point, I'm going to say kind of um, compete and replace what has been the, Sil the Silicon Valley so far. And then of course you have also a great uh, portion of GDP um, spent for the enhancement of digital economy. And then you have the second part. If the first part was inward looking, so the idea of what we do inside and you know for our own um, people, this, the, the second part is a bit of outward looking. How do we attract skilled people inside China, uh, sorry, to come to China? Um, and this is again, the creation of this technological hub. And also, this is particularly interesting for anybody who wants to work and live in China, is the idea to improve the quality of life for expats, high skilled expats who go to China. Right now, there's a bit of an issue with, you know, permanent residence permits um, and the welfare state around foreigners. They have um, a plan to improve that. They, but again, this plan is not entirely clear. They're still debating it. So we don't know when we'll see an actual materialization of these commitments. Um, at the moment, they're exploring something similar to what Australia has. So a point system for immigrants, the more points you have, then of course, the more likely it is you can have um, a more permanent resident permit and so on and so forth. Um, and here you can see everything. I can definitely share these slides with you later. It's nothing uh, particularly private or anything. All of this is from the draft of the five-year plan, so it's relatively public. And then you have the increase in self-sufficiency in general. So beyond technology and the reasons why, the reason why I passed a little bit quickly through the technology part is because we speak very often about how China wants to become self-sufficient technologically. So the idea that it has realized that technologically it does depend a lot on other um, actors. And up to a few years ago, when we were talking about, well, a few months ago, when we were talking about, for example, decoupling and we were making our assessments, we realized that, um, the technological sector will be one of the most difficult sectors for China and the US to decouple. And now is the sector where decoupling is most likely to happen, even though it is the most difficult. So technological self-sufficiency and technological primacy and the ability to shape technological norms is definitely a priority, but it's something that we discuss very often. Um, so if you want to go more in depth into that particular aspect, we can do that in the question uh, part of the, of the webinar. In more general terms, uh, what is interesting is the idea of an increase of sufficiency, generally speaking. So the two first points are perhaps the most important. Um, China depends a lot from external actors for oil, and gas and other raw materials, but also food production is a bit of an issue. With a population such as that of China and the increase in wealth of this population, food production has become increasingly an issue for China. So the idea of strengthening its own agricultural sector and food production is something that China is really uh, going to um, aim for. And then another issue, which, however, is not unique to China, is rather <laughs> present in all um, in most economies, is the support for small and medium enterprises. Um, we see a type of um, 
globalization, a type of global economy that necessarily um, is more favorable to bigger actors, economic actors. So when it comes to small and medium enterprises, which are the basis of most economies, however, and they're very important for China as well, although we all often speak of, you know, Chinese state-owned enterprises, we know these massive conglomerates, um, China's economy relies as well on small and medium enterprises. Um, this is another issue, mainly after the COVID-19 um, pandemic, that China will have to devote quite a bit of energy to. And here you see some sectors in which, again, it would like to give it a boost. Um, and of course, again, you can see a bit of a focus on uh, technology, on cutting edge, not, cutting edge technology, one of which is particularly interesting, which is aerial engines, because that is one of the sectors where China and the US, for example, are the most linked and is one of the main sectors of export from the US to China. Um, and then just very briefly and so very quickly, you know, improving internal industrial corridors, the BRI not necessarily as we often studied, so not the BRI in outside of China, but the BRI inside of China, how to connect to better connect China, and then how to diversify energy production. So because China is dependent from other countries for oil and gas, how do you diversify nuclear energy, of course. Sorry again. Okay. Um, and then this very briefly again, um, uh, the green commitments. As I told you at the very beginning, there was a lot of hope for China to adopt some very pragmatic targets that could give us an idea of what would be the path towards his more long-term ambitions. This hasn't quite happened. Um, all the new sort of targets are very, very similar to those of the 13th five-year plan, so not much of a change. Mainly if you think that most of the time the reduction is on GDP, is per GDP unit, and when the GDP keeps growing, of course, that kind of makes it a relative, a relative reduction. Um, and then again, this meant that, you know, yeah, you do see some targets, but you don't really see the ambition that China um, expresses narratively into these targets. So as far as the green commitments are concerned, we still have to see where um, this will materialize. Of course, when you speak with people that actually are experts in this, which I am not, um, they highlight how, however, China has always kept its commitments. So it is very unlikely that it would um, announce globally such big and important commitments without planning to um, abide to them. And on the other side, and I think it's relevant for the next, no, it's not, <laughs> it's relevant in two slides time, um, is the fact that green revolution and um, the climate debate is one of the areas in which China wants to play a core and central role um, in shaping the global narrative. So it wants to be particularly active um, in, on the global uh, platform. And then there's this final section, which is the one about protection. And I put a question mark because arguably China has become much less protective than it used to be. Um, mostly if you think economically, it has opened up a lot more sector than it used to. Um, right now, you do see that, you know, even foreign direct investments have a lot more capacity to grow um, within China than they used to. Um, of course, then you have the caveat that often it is in sectors where China ha already has established enterprises or it is because they still don't have knowledge in that particular niche of uh, action. But again, you can argue that. But the type of protection that I'm talking about is not necessarily that of, it's not necessarily economic. It can be if you think about intellectual property rights up to a few well, it's, it's a long-standing debate that about international intellectual property rights. The West has always wanted China to adopt an intellectual property rights regulation that could protect uh, intellectual property. China has always kind of never quite got it, never quite agreed to it. 
But now that China is produce, producing intellectual property, it has an interest in uh, adopting an international property um, regulation. So we'll see that from that point of view, we'll see a bit of protection of his own um, intellectual production. But what I think I meant here was mainly protection in a more traditional term, in a more defense and military term. So one thing that was big when the draft of the five-year plan emerged was the 6.8% um, defense budget that went allocated uh, from China to the defense sector. And uh, um, it is definitely an important step forward, but in line with what we saw in the past years, the idea that China you know, is investing more in its own defense and in the innovation of its own military force. Um, and it's still one fourth of what the US actually spends in um, defense. But one thing that I think is relevant for China in particular is the fact that it's extremely well integrated. It's a system that is well integrated to defend Chinese immediate interests. Okay, so we can think about obvious examples like the South China Sea, Taiwan, and so on and so forth. This is something that is relevant to bear in mind when we think about um, defense budget. And then you have less traditional areas, such as space exploration, the deep sea exploration, the Arctic exploration, and all of these as both sort of a non-traditional military, non-traditional security aspect, as well as a, well, still, you know, an idea of creating more self-sufficiency, find raw materials that you need, and kind of plant your flag and say, well, here is my and I think this is it for this section. And then I'll conclude with this last element, which I think is important, is China's expressing his um, intention, not that it was needed, but you know, at least he is expressing it, his intention to play a more um, important role in the global stage. So to commit to participate more actively to global governance and multilateral fora. No idea why there is for a is actually for a. Um, and if you, of course, you here you can think about the WTO reform. You can think about what we talked about earlier, which is you know the green um, revolution, and but most importantly, perhaps, is the idea of shaping norms that will follow the fourth technological revolution. So, and here you have such a um, rich and diverse set of things that would go into this um, aspect. I think we would need a webinar just for this, but of course, if there are any questions on this, I'd be happy to go more in depth. And one thing that of course is still debated is, you know, yeah, of course you want, China wants to shape new, wants to shape the multilateral um, system um, to a certain degree. Um, and it wants to be more active in the multilateral fora, but, there's clearly a push, and this has been around for several years in terms of scholar analysis. There's clearly a, there's clearly a push for a multipolarity rather than multipolarism. Sorry, rather than multilateralism. Multilateralism is definitely useful in certain areas and is appreciated in terms of multilateral fora. But in terms of influence and in terms of who can act where, um, China clearly has a preference for multipolarity, but this is not expressed in the five-year plan. So this is sort of an adjunct to the conversation that we've had so far. Um, so just to conclude, this is what I wanted to say. There is a mixture of caution and pragmatism in setting the quantitative goals. And honestly, I think that some of them are very pragmatic in terms of, for example, China saying that it will take China 30 years to catch up technologically with the US. It's just, you know, a pragmatic evaluation of where they stand is not just something that they say to um, give a peace of mind of, to, to the US. Um, but there's a lot of ambition in their medium and long term goals, and I think this is clear and evident. There's ambitions on the global stage as well. They've just realized they need to build a very strong internal basis to have um, a bit uh, to have um, well to have a basis on which to act for on the global stage. Internal and home affairs remain the priority. They've always been a priority, but I think in this five-year plan, you see a highlight of how much of, an, of a priority is. 
they will be more protective. This means that also in terms of identity and values, we've seen, oh, I forgot about that, but we've seen this, that they will be more protective in terms of their position, identity and values, and they will be more assertive. Um, and I conclude here. Thank you to all of you for listening. Um, I'll try to stop the screen share. I have. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca, for this uh, comprehensive analysis of the five-year plan. I think that there will be some questions. Uh, you have touched some, some relevant points also to understand how China is going to you know, to 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 undertake to to take a stance that is different from the past in the next five years, and and you know, and in the future in general. I have you know many questions actually, but I I, I would like to, to you know to give uh, also space to the other to other participants. Um, the first, but I I would like to ask you personally. I I am. Quite, uh, I quite appreciated your uh, your commentary uh, that you had written for um, Affari Internazionali. Uh, this commentary is titled "Caution and Ambition Inform China's New Five Year Plan." I have appreciated the way you analyze the two sessions, um, with a focus on the objectives that constitute an element of caution in this plan. One part in particular caught my attention. You mentioned that. Um, that China aspires to become an international hub for talents, as you as you also mentioned today. Um, I find this particularly interesting, considering also um, the fact that China would like to to decouple from from other economies uh, for technology. And um, so, I now during the COVID nineteen pandemic, as you also uh, said, uh, during this period, we've seen that it is hard to go to China to do business, to do research, to study and that we cannot predict which will be the future um, regarding this matter. So also the flows of people, mobility of people has not stopped, but is severely limited, we know that. So during this period that sees many countries still struggling to reduce contagions, do you think that the range of action will be quite limited for this goal to be fully achieved? And if, if there is a relation between this goal and the part of the plan that involves intellectual property rights, considering also the mixture of caution and ambition of the Chinese leadership, which used to set up, uh, as we know, short, but also medium, long-term plans, what would be uh, the possible outlook, particularly on this matter? So attracting talents from, from other countries. Okay, thank you, brilliant. Um, well, of course, I think that when they <laughs> drafted the five-year plan, they were thinking about a time where it's slightly easier to move around. We know that exception made for students, and I know that many of you have been hit by this. Um, at the moment, some um, employers and employees have been able to go back to China and work there. Um, so from that point of view, definitely there has been a development already, but in terms of the five-year plan, of course, it's a five-year plan. So the idea is that it will develop in the next five years. And hopefully, I hope for the you know mental health of all of us, this pandemic we won't be going on for that for five years. Um, and the aspect of this that regards, um, so you called it a coupling. I don't think that at least officially, and I don't think it's entirely feasible, China wants to decouple entirely from the rest of the world. It wants more control over, you know, more self-sufficiency over core technologies. It wants more control over um, its own ability to not having to depend on the external world for technology. To a certain degree, yes, it is a decoupling. I just think we need to think about decoupling not necessarily as a one-dimensional thing that you know is either out or in, yes. Um, in terms of that, uh, it's a bit complicated. There's a separation between country and people. So, of course, if you think about China and the US, you think they want to separate. But then there are a lot of Chinese um, people who want to study and develop technology in the US. And there are a lot of American people and, you know, European people who see the, the opportunity of going to China where uh, to develop technology and to do research and development. 
Um, and here you have two aspects, I think. One is definitely to attract this talent in um, this foreign talent in China and, you know, make them grow there, give them all the opportunities. So individually, you would have a lot of opportunities. But then, of course, the likelihood is that the, internet, the intellectual property of what you produce belongs to the university or the center that it is in China. That is nothing new. Like that is the case also in the West. If I produce something new, it belongs to King's College London. It doesn't belong to me. OK, so that's actually quite common. And the other aspect is the idea that a lot of um, still a lot of students that go abroad mainly in the us um, and do in in the sector of science and technology then stay in the us they don't go back to china of course in the past few years you had a growing number of chinese students and then go back to china but still not quite enough um, and of course so this is the other aspect the idea of retaining um retaining the students the chinese students um, in china and I think there is also uh, one more thing, which is employment wise and education wise. So education wise, China is going to aim a lot more uh, to boost high school um, education and middle school education in the S and T science and technology sector to have more students than then develop and go um, to the higher education and then, you know, become researchers and develop technology. But then you have an issue in China already, which is employment. There are a lot of students who have excellent degrees and have excellent curricula, but then you, they can't find jobs. Um, so I think there's a bit of a gap there. There is a lot of ambition, as I told you, but um, I think Beijing and you know not only have a lot of things they will have to concentrate on in order to make this particular aspect work. I, I hope I answered your question. I have a feeling I yes, missed yes. a piece. Okay. Thank you. And yeah, I, I, I think that in, in a sense, this caution that you're talking about maybe also is about having all of these issues, you know, to, to solve also the employment rates that are, are you know, are lowering like since uh, I, if I'm not wrong from last year, last year employment rate was already very low due also to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also for other, you know, there are other factors at play. And yeah, do you think that this also plays a role like in, in deciding, like in the decision uh, of China to be conscious on in, in, an, in its uh, five-year plan? I think so. I mean, of course, the pandemic does play a role and um, undeniably the reality of things calls for China to be more pragmatic and more cautious. Um, and again, it is also not to disappoint the population. So you can't promise the stars and then just achieve not even one tenth of what you promised. So absolutely. And there are lots of obstacles. It's not just about education and employment, it's about you know, urbanization, the quality of jobs. So it's not just about you know, giving jobs, they're going to have an issue like most of us with the gig economy, like how do you regulate the gig economy It's also about the quality of jobs, the, the pay of these jobs, the welfare that you have, and these um, elements. So I think they realize they have a lot of open issues inside the country. And that's one of the reasons why I think they want to tidy up all of this uh, confusion um, and that is the reason they stressed quality over quantity and it's not going to be an easy task that's the the, the problem that's a challenge for sure <laughs> it makes sense um, so I will go uh, I will proceed asking everyone if they have some questions I remind you that you can send a message to the account named European One Seat to write your question, and you can specify you want to, uh, to, to ask the question directly to Francesca, and, or if you prefer me to, to just read the question. Um, we already have one question from um, Julia. Um, she asks, uh, she says that for the first time, the latest five-year plan refers to China's 
longer term climate goals and introduces the idea of a CO2 emissions cap, though it does not go so far as to set one, as you mentioned today. What do you think is the reason behind that? Which implications will the dual circulation and the focus on the domestic market have for foreign companies uh, or for trade with other countries? These are the two questions from, from Julia. Okay, sorry. I'm writing it down so I don't forget anything. Take your time. <laughs> Mm, the reason for uh, not setting precise targets in terms of emission is very easy. Um, so China wants to grow, wants to provide its population with a better quality of life, and this requires high emissions. So one issue, issue China will have is to balance lowering the emission and at the same time being able to grant to his people the quality of life that he has been promising. And again, if we mention some of the things that we have uh, talked about today, such as, you know, the gap between uh, ur urban areas and rural areas, or if we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the desire to increase the level of urbanization, all this and the quality of jobs, all of these things um, are difficult and the quality of life, all of these things are difficult to achieve if at the same time you are trying to lower your level of emissions because there's gonna be a transition phase in which um, you, people in general, not just people in China, this is gonna affect us as well. There's gonna be a transition phase in which the quality of life of people will be impacted by the transition into a green economy. And while it is easier for, it is difficult, but easier for advanced economies like, you know, Western and Western economies to say, well, you know, we're gonna have to make some sacrifices um, to a certain degree easier, of course, I'm making it much more simpler than it is. For a country such as China that has been basing his entire, you know, his entire narrative on uh, economic welfare and on economic well-being um, is going to be even more difficult. And this is probably one of the reasons why in the past few years we've also seen a shift towards a more nationalist narrative rather than one based on economy. The idea you need different bases, you need, you need something different for keep, to keep people engaged with your um, program. And as far as dual circulation is concerned, this is extremely difficult because we don't really know what dual circulation is. So we know it means that China wants to um, rely, again, this is connected with the emission again, China wants to rely on um, internal consumption more rather than, uh, you know, global consumption to uh, support its economy. Um, again, if you want more internal consumption, you need to consume more, but you know where I'm going. But we don't know in, in the short and medium term, it wouldn't change much for foreign enterprises uh, operating in China or for um, foreign trade between China and foreign countries. But in the long term, the ideal would be for China to be able to decide because it's sufficiently self-sufficient to be able to decide which foreign companies are needed in the country, which are not, which countries would be good to trade with and in which um, sectors and which are not. So in the long term, the risk is to have a more arbitrary um, foreign trade and a more arbitrary action of foreign enterprises within China. But again, it's at least for me, I don't know whether an economist could give you a better answer. It is difficult to um, give you an idea of how in the long term this would look like. Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, you have also, you know, um, I appreciate that you have made the relation with the, with the emissions because actually there, all of this is related to what we were talking about also, employment rates, education, that are processes that take um, long, long, longer time to, you know, to, to achieve some goals. 
And so I think that everyone is connected somehow, even though the five-year plan, if you look at the, at the document, um, also the commentary uh, written by Francesca, uh, you see that we don't have precise information about everything. Uh, so probably many things will kind of be, you know, um, formulated, designed or uh, applied through the process during these five years. Um, there is another question uh, from Orlanda. She would like to, to ask you directly. So Orlanda, I give the floor to you uh, for, the, for your question. Hello. Thank you. Thanks so much for your presentation, Francesca. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask a question about whether China's shaping of international norms, i.e. through the environment and technology, relate, relate to China generally being more idealistic or whether it connects directly to securing its regime security. The reason why I ask this question is because I see many narratives focusing on China as attempting to secure global norms for very rational purposes, i.e. national security. So I'd be quite interested to hear your response. Thank you. Thank you. This is a tremendously interesting question. Um, and I can, you know, only speculate uh, and give you my opinion. I wish I could have talks with the high levels of the um, CCP and give you a certain answer. I think he is a little bit of both. Um, definitely always with China, sorry, with the CCP, the primary security concern is to um, secure regime stability. So the idea that the CCP needs to stay where it is and it needs to be governing, of course, since the arrival of Xi Jinping, this has taken a slightly different turn into securing Xi Jinping position as well. But I think that also with the arrival of Xi Jinping, you also have a lot more um, idealism and you have a lot more uh, work to shape uh, a different type of, uh, you know, not, not a different type, to shape um, China's identity quite clearly, to shape Chinese values quite clearly, to have an idea of, you know, who we are and um, why are we different from the rest. Okay, so I do think is a bit of both. Primarily is definitely, however, the idea of the survival of the CCP and the survival of the type of government that is China, but increasingly more so is also the idea of occupying a more powerful position, not just because this grants you more space of maneuver, but also because this grants you a status that would pay back, that would be the sort of payback for the century of humiliation. I had to mention it at a certain point. So I think there's a bit of both. Um, and according to what you look at, uh, you can see one of the two being predominant. I hope I gave an answer to your question. I don't know whether you wanted a more in-depth analysis or whether you were thinking about one specific aspect, but generally speaking, I think this, this is how I see it. Thank you, Francesca. Um, there is another question from uh, by Julia. She would like to ask you whether the cultural and creative industries emerged as one of the focuses in this uh, five-year plan. So from the drafts that I looked at, I don't think I saw anything. I'm trying to think now. It's, it's, it's not... It's not a small document, <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I don't think so. I don't think there was much of an attention to that side, but I could be wrong. So here, perhaps you can see my limits. I do have great limits and this is definitely one of those. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you 100% no, but I, at least it didn't grasp my attention. Yes, uh, thank you. In any case, if you would like to read uh, the five-year plan, the original document, the commentary written by Francesca and other materials that we suggest for, uh, for this topic, you can, um, you can look at our websites on social media, especially on Twitter, and we will also uh, write a report at the end of this webinar so you can more 
you know, go more in depth into the specific uh, issues that, you know, um, in which you are mostly interested in. Um, there is another uh, question from Giovanni. Uh, she, uh, he would like to ask uh, directly to you, so I, I will give the floor to him. Yeah, thank you. And first of all, Francesca, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and it was very, very interesting. Uh, I had a question about um, what you said at the beginning. You, you said that there was this uh, focus rather on, on quality than, than quantity. And I'm, I'm not an expert, so I've, I'm not sure. But I think that I, I've ever heard also for the previous one or even for the, the two, two plans back, and I remember that one of them has a focus on uh, this quite ambitious policy or project of uh, Made in China 2025. And I was wondering, because I haven't read the document this year, if there was any mention, if, if they have, still have this project or, or where they are about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Giovanni. Definitely um, quite an expert now too. Um, yeah, so one thing that probably didn't come up from what I was presenting is that this five year plan is not in rupture with what, what, what happened before and with previous five year plans is actually quite a consistent and continuous um, path. So you can see definitely that even before there was this shift from quantity to quality, you just have it enshrined in this five year plan. And as far as the Made in China 2025 is concerned, this is interesting um, because no, is not present in this five year plan as a flagship idea as it was before. This is for two reasons. One is because of the type of backlash it had received back in the days. So when it was announced in, um, in the US, but also in, in Europe, you had kind of a um, negative backlash because China was announcing that it was going to com compete economically in those sectors where more advanced economies already were established, which I mean, we live in a... Um, globalized capitalistic world so that shouldn't be a surprise for anybody or an issue for anybody but of course because you don't have a level playing field in terms of rules of the game this becomes a bit more of an issue when it comes to China um, and following that type of backlash what we've noticed is that for a while at least from the from Xi Jinping's side there was a bit of getting quieter in terms of, of making these massive announcements of flagship projects and then you have the duo circulation that kind of says the same exact things of what the Made in China 2021 was saying in just different terms. Um, so that is why in this five year plan, you have a lot less attention on the Made in China 2025 as a flagship um, project. We have another question uh, from uh, Alexandra. Um, she says, although that although the plan is focused on uh, internal issues, uh, she says, if you whether you have thoughts on how the new five year plan will influence us living in Europe, if there would be, I think she would like to ask you if there would be some impact on, you know, other countries and the European Union. Sure, um, I think that part of this impact was already um, visible before this five-year plan. So the idea that China, for example, began to invest in very specific areas and in very specific enterprises. So you have like a first phase after the global financial crisis when you know China was investing very freely, a lot of capital everywhere, um, even in non-profitable from both an economic and geopolitical point of view um, projects. And then you have a shift after 2016, 2017, when China begins to invest and um, do agreements in a much more focused, in a much more um, aware manner. 
um, and I think that will continue. So you will, and that is also why you see a shift from, for example, in Europe, investments in major economies, such as Germany, France, uh, I know it sounds weird, but Italy and the UK, to uh, more attention to, for example, uh, Northern European countries, where they have very niche um, industries and enterprises that uh, build something that China very much needs, also in terms of knowledge. And I think that will continue. Um, in terms of the impact that will have on us in Europe, and that is a bit uh, connected to the to a question we had before, I I don't know whether you know. So from one point of view, the fact that the investment, for example, um, environment in China is becoming more regulated, this is positive for European enterprises because they can go in China with a much clearer idea of where they can, where they cannot invest and how to invest. Um, and this is regardless of whether the comprehensive agreement on investments between China and uh, the European Union is completed. Um, and the fact that China is going to adopt a coherent negative list for all the country, that is also positive because it gives you the ability again to have a roadmap before you get into China. This doesn't mean that it's going to be ideal. It doesn't mean that there are not going to be some of the issues that enterprises have already experienced in uh, working in China, but it's, it's, it's definitely an improving situation. Again, what it means, however, is that China has some sectors of interest. And if you operate in these sectors of interest, then you're very much lucky because then you can definitely have more opportunities, more connection, and you can see your business grow uh, in the medium term. In the long term, you always have the risk of, you know, I mean, admittedly, there's a risk of knowledge transfer and then you being slowly sidelined. Um, generally speaking you know you have that opportunity however this means that if your business is not in one of the sectors that china is interested in at the moment you basically have very very small chance of um first being able to compete with chinese um, enterprises and secondly to uh, see opportunities generally speaking if we want to make a bit of a more uh, general assessment of course China has increasingly become an economic competitor of the of Europe of the European Union, which for some states is not much of an issue because, for example, for manufacturing states, it has almost always been the case. In the Italian case, it was like that since the very beginning, right? For other states who were more, you know, um, relying on added value and services, for example, is relatively new. So it's relatively again, because now is what 2021 is, it has been so since at least 2016. So again, relatively new. Um, but what we can see is that it will be increasingly so you will increasingly have areas in which you compete against the Chinese counterparts and you have uh, will have areas mostly in technology. Um, and a bit of self-promotion, I'll be coming out on a paper in which I compare um, the European Union technological um, advancement with China's. But mainly in technology, you'll see that there are certain areas in which the EU, for example, can't compete with China. And in, in that case, it will have to push for niche knowledge for a certain very specific area in which it wants to develop its knowledge in order to have that edge. Um, yeah, I hope I answered again the question because sometimes I just get lost in the stream of what I'm saying. I'm not quite sure where I started. Indeed, there are so many things to say about this. Uh, when you were when you were speaking, when you were speaking, I was thinking about one thousand things. I was thinking about Asia, Southeast Asia, so also manufacturers, uh, the manufacturer sector, uh, but also you know uh, the high skilled uh, workforce in Europe, as you know, um, as always been uh, you know an added value indeed. But China is uh, at the moment is is not you know, is not anymore, at least in my view, uh, that export uh, or trade oriented country and is looking for more, you know, as you said, for high skilled talents and wants to be self sufficient. So we have to expect to enter in a more competitive environment in the future. I think that we uh, have, you know, uh, finished here for today with the questions, but 
If you have any other questions that you would like to send us, even after this webinar, you can send uh, you can send an email to us or you can reach out to Francesca uh, by email. And uh, you'll also find this video recorded and published on YouTube on our European One C uh, YouTube account. Um, I think that at least for today, we have reached a certain level of knowledge about the five-year plan. So I really thank you for having presented and also ask, uh, answer to our questions. Um, I, I'm, really, I'm really happy that you, that you are here today with us. I personally think that your research provides um, valuable elements for a better understanding of EU-China relations. And I can say it as a reader, but also as a former intern of EI, and it is great to have your contribution to activities and goals of European YMC. Um, we attach great importance to uh, understanding. So that is a fundamental premise for policymaking, for diplomacy, for many other things. And you have certainly indeed a precious piece to, to this puzzle, let's say, by presenting a part of your research and, and, and of your wisdom, let's say. And in a few seconds, you should see uh, the, the final tool for gathering your opinions about this topic. Uh, please note that um, uh, you will um, please know that your selection is anonymous, so we won't see your name. Uh, the results will be shared and will be considered for following analysis and especially for uh, our newsletter. So let's vote. Yeah, by looking at the poll, I realized we didn't talk about global supply chains, but there's just so much to talk about. And yeah, I forgot to say, Laria was one of our interns at uh, EIA, yeah, so it was it was amazing to have her there, and it's amazing to see what you guys are doing with this project. So, um, Thank you. congrats! It's, it's really great, and. I hope you had better speaker than I am. I know I'm a bit confused sometimes, but um, yeah, again, congratulations for such a great project. Thank you. So nice to hear that. Um, I, uh, I think that for today we have finished, but if you would like to go more in depth into supply chains or other, other topics, I know that you are more uh, also a lot into FDI in particular. So, if in the future you would like to speak about it, you are welcome. We will always be here welcoming you. Thank you, thank you. So I am waiting for the final answers to be displayed. So we will, we will look through uh, the, the answers to see also you know, uh, the percentages of people that answer to certain, um, to the questions. Okay, here we are. About the first question was dual circulation calls for heightened Chinese focus on autosufficiency and increase of domestic consumption and reliance. What effects could this have on multilateralism? 34% of people answered some global value chains might be disrupted, causing negative effects. But a greater percentage of people answered C, so they think that dual circulation only aims to produce domestic effects, but that the national growth that it produces will also generate opportunities for international exchanges to grow. And less, less people answered B, so virtually known. Uh, the second question, Xi Jinping previously announced that the intention to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, here we are, uh, and sustainability was the main discussion in the last five-year plan. So do you think the measures announced in the FYP would be enough to achieve the above-mentioned goal? And we have a disparity here because almost 70% of people uh, answered that, that it is still too hard to say. The policy changes adopted so far have not had dramatic results. However, they could improve much in the years to come. And we have a parity between A and C, as you can see. And the, the, the third question about um, the fact that the, the, the five-year plan states that China will promote the research and development of its own digital currency. The question was, will this help internationalize the UN? Uh, this is also very interesting. Um, the majority of people answer that there are some available opportunities such, so as it's used for payment systems in online platforms partially or fully owned by China, but it's still too early to say. 
But here we have also some people that that say yes, it will help bring the UN closer to for to challenge in the the, domain, the dominance of the US dollar. And we have probably a topic for for another webinar because then you know the, the digital UN is also another another frontier of of research, and I think it's quite it's, it's very interesting. Um, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I think that. I mean, I, I, I think I can speak for everyone. It's been exciting, it's been inspiring and also very useful. So I, I really much appreciated that you uh, came uh, here today, joined us in this conversation, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you to you all again. And it was a great conversation, uh, awesome questions. So thank you again for having me. Thank you everyone for participating today. Thank you.